Okay, let's take a look at something called absorption versus variable costing. So, so far we've used a costing concept known as absorption costing. And why, you're asking. Well, generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP requires absorption costing for external financial reporting and the internal revenue service. So the IRS requires it for tax preparation. Under absorption costing, all manufacturing related costs, whether fixed or variable, are absorbed into the cost of the product. So under absorption costing, no distinction is made between manufacturing costs that arise and fall with production volume and costs that remain fixed. So supporters of absorption costing argue that all costs, whether fixed or variable, are necessary for production to occur, so all these costs should become part of the individuable cost of the product. Now on the other hand, many accountants and managers don't agree. They argue that fixed manufacturing costs are related to available production capacity and will be incurred regardless of the actual production volume which occurs during the period. So since these costs are going to be incurred regardless of volume, they should be treated as a period cost and expensed immediately. So as I mentioned just a second ago, absorption costing is required for GAAP. So under absorption costing, products absorb fixed manufacturing costs as well as variable manufacturing costs. So both fixed and variable manufacturing costs is treated as inventoriable product costs, which you can see here. We've got direct materials, direct labor, variable manufacturing overhead, and fixed manufacturing overhead. Now they're assigning it a per unit cost here. So we get a total cost per unit of $75. Now under a variable costing, this fixed manufacturing overhead component is considered a period cost and not a product cost. So that drops the cost of the product down to $50. Now variable costing only assigns variable manufacturing costs like direct materials, direct labor, and variable manufacturing overhead. Fixed manufacturing overhead is treated as a period cost. So something called contribution margin income statements are going to be used for internal management decisions because they're not GAAP. And I'll show you what that looks like here in just a second. So as discussed before, absorption costing is required by GAAP in the IRS, yet variable costing is typically preferred for internal decision making and performance evaluation purposes. Thus managers are often exposed to both sets of information. So for manufacturers, the costing systems will yield different results for operating income when inventory levels increase or decrease, and we'll touch upon that in a minute. So managers can easily reconcile the difference between the two income figures using this formula. You take the change in inventory levels in units and multiply that times the fixed overhead per month. So a contribution margin income statement is going to cl classify costs and expenses as fixed or variable. So it will report something called contribution margin in the body of the income statement. So what contribution margin is, is you take all of your revenue and you subtract all of the variable costs. That gives you contribution margin. From contribution margin then you subtract your fixed cost from that and it typically will give you the same net income as a traditional income statement assuming that products produced and um, sold are the same. So here's an example of a traditional income statement. You've got sales minus cost of goods sold which gives you gross profit. Then you subtract your operating expenses to give you net operating income for external reporting purposes. Now here's an example of a contribution margin income statement. Here we're organizing cost by behavior rather than function. Um, the contribution margin income statement begins with sales, you see, then we subtract variable costs. Sales minus variable costs gives us contribution margin. This is an indicator of how much sales contribute towards fixed costs. Then we subtract our fixed costs and that gives us operating income. So GAAP does not allow companies to use the contribution margin format for external reporting purposes, but managers do find contribution margin income statements more helpful than traditional income statements for planning and decision making purposes. And later on in the course we will spend a significant of time preparing contribution margin income statements when we do our CVP analysis, cost volume, profit. 
So this chart kind of gives you a nice actual summary. It's a little small and I apologize for that, but it does give you a nice um, summary about key points between variable costing or uh, and absorption costing. So with variable costing, um, it treats all fixed manufacturing overhead costs as operating expenses in the period incurred rather than treating them as an inventoriable product cost. Can only be used internally, never for external reporting. And it often does result in better decision making than absorption or what we call traditional costing. Because it gives managers the additional cost of making one more unit of product, which is the variable cost per unit. It's often better for performance evaluation than absorption costing because it doesn't give managers an incentive to build unnecessary inventory. We'll touch upon that in just a second. And then it will result in a different operating income than absorption costing for managers whose inventory levels do increase or decrease during the period. The contribution margin income statement is organized by cost behavior. Again, we first subtract variable expenses from sales revenue to arrive at contribution margin. Then we subtract out fixed expenses to arrive at operating income. Some find it more useful than traditional income statement for planning and decision making because it distinguishes between costs that will be affected by volume. The variable costs from those that are unaffected, which are the fixed costs. It can, again, only be used internally and it should show the same operating income as a traditional income statement for service firms, merchandising companies, and manufacturers only if their inventory levels remain stable. For all re Taylor's cost of goods sold is considered a variable cost. So just real quickly, let's touch upon um, why operating income might not always be the same between the two costing systems. It's only going to be the same if the manufacturer sells exactly what is produced during the period. This is what you might find for a lean producer because they're producing inventory just in time to fill existing customer orders. However, traditional manufacturers often produce extra safety stock, which increases their inventory levels to ensure against unexpected demand. So if they're doing that, and they're um, producing more units that are sold, your absorption costing income is going to be higher than variable costing. And you're asking me why? Well, because under absorption costing, those fixed costs are going to be product costs. So they're going to be held with that inventory that is sitting on the balance sheet as finished goods inventory only until those units are sold will it become an expense. So if it sits in inventory, that means your expenses will be smaller than they would have been under um, variable costing when those expenses would have been um, expensed as a period cost. Now the opposite is true then uh, when inventories decline, when fewer units are produced than sold. In this case, absorption costing income would be lower than variable costing income because again more units were sold um, than produced which means more of those expenses would have been in not necessarily incurred but charged as an expense rather than sitting in inventory. So there's some potentially undesirable manager incentives created by absorption costing and managers may try to increase production to build up inventory in order to minimize or maximize their bonus. And uh, the contribution margin income statement for that reason is usually a better management tool.